Oh, thank you guys for hanging in there. We're, we're almost done. We have one last little um, exciting part to go through today, and that's that we're going to have a pediatric roundtable discussion. So I'd like to invite Tammy and Bruce to come up as well. And I'm going to just throw out some topics um, for them to discuss. And if you have something that you're interested in, we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, and we sort of sat around thinking about what topics might be interesting that were interesting to us as well. So we have about 20, 25 minutes before the soiree to get going with this. So I'll start by asking you um, all to discuss what N plus one looks like in your institution for staffing models. You want me to start? Okay. Uh, thank you, ladies first. Uh, so for us, and I, and I know, because uh, Jim and I practice a little bit differently, but um, we are a one primary perfusionist per case. So we are a true N plus one. So we, we always have an extra person floating, supporting um, our call schedule. We do have two people on call all the time. Majority of events, we do have two people come in to do, especially emergencies, eCPR, um, just so that everyone's very supported. So for clarification, if you had a transplant or a night case, you would have another body in the house at all times? Yeah, absolutely. OK. So when I first started at um, Cincinnati Children's, I had either been somewhere where I was the only perfusionist in-house, or we did an N plus one model at my uh, institution just previous uh, to Children's. And I, quite frankly, just really, but, but when I got to Children's, they were doing, so we do two N. So it's two perfusionists on every case. If there's two pump cases going, there's four perfusionists, in, not just in-house, but our backer is sitting there in the room the entire time, uh, along with the primary perfusionist. Um, Cincinnati Children's is very well supported and very, and, and it, this is something that our surgeons like. It's something that we really like. It's something that I never thought I would want or need. I've been doing cases for a hundred years before I got to Children's and I've been doing them by myself. So why would I need them? Well, it's because I'm human and I'm stupid and I mess things up. And I need somebody to help me sometimes and help me remember to do things and, uh, uh, and, and be able to run outside the room and fetch a, fetch a cannula or something that doesn't happen to be sitting in the room or, or I ran out of plasma, or whatever it is, um, uh, or especially in the most extreme situations where I have to change out an oxygenator. And a lot of places will say, well, we'll have a nurse do it, or uh, anesthesiologists will help us. And, and those people are all incredibly capable, but they have no idea what the terminology that we use and the slang that we use, especially in a, a crazy, heated situation that another perfusionist absolutely knows. So, um, so for us, uh, that's a long-winded answer to 2M. Yeah, no, that's great. Bruce, how about you? We run two simulated rooms every single morning. <laughs> and we put three students in each room. One runs the cameras, one becomes the surgeon, and the other one becomes the perfusionist. They all learn uh, cardiopulmonary bypass by looking at it from a different angle. If you have to evaluate um, how well somebody's delivering cardioplegia and you can't use your own eyes by standing behind them, then you better know what it is you have to look for. So we abstract the idea that uh, the person running the cameras is learning just as much about perfusion, even if they're not turning the knobs, because they've got to think that far ahead to get the cameras where they need to be. Everything is videotaped, and every student has to watch every one of their cases and 20 of their classmates' cases and write about them and answer the question, what will I do well? What will I do better next time? Uh, what did I do well? What could I do better on? And what's my plan for improving on that? Just as an aside at Stanford, our N plus one model looks like everybody does their own case. And we've just recently had buy-in from the hospital to have another body in the house from 10 to six. So we are by ourselves at night and we have been very too self-sufficient, I would say for too many years. For a long time, we would start a case and finish it regardless of the nature of the case. And when our cases started going for 36 hours instead of just 24, we started breaking each other out, so. Okay, next up, DO2. Are you using it? Are you measuring it? What are you thinking about? What are your targets? We teach it. You teach it. What do you teach? We teach that it was originally introduced at 270, but the number probably now is 300, and the students better have that number when you ask them, which is in the beginning of the case. So it's part of their morning calculations for every case. And then as we get into the second semester, when we start asking them, uh, do you see anything in this patient's chart that would suggest that they're at increased risk for neurologic or pulmonary or renal or cardiac failure or coagulation issues? This is what they're supposed to be looking for in the chart. 
if they get to the ki the kidney part and they don't mention DO2I, then you know they're certainly not scoring the points because all of the literature comes from kidneys. Three hundred. Okay. Um, we we're monitoring it. We we have spectrum. I think could we see a show of hands in the room of who is electronically monitoring DO2? Definitely majority, but not Don't everyone. Put your hand down. We're only doing it on one machine. <laughs> you know, I think you're definitely at, uh, at 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 least a challenging place if you don't have the technology for it. So I think over the next you know five to ten years, everyone's going to be replacing equipment, and then it might be a little bit easier. But there are some apps now that you can use, and you know some different technology that's not necessarily integrated. But we do have the spectrum pumps. We do look at the number. I think right, right now it's not a huge discussion point with our surgeons, and part of that is because of temperature. We do cool to some degree for most of our cases. So we did just start to incorporate, we're just looking at it now, so there's nothing actionable. But uh, Spectrum has the formula, the formula, what do they call it? The formula editor, thank you. And they do take into account 7% per degree. Um, and so now we'll be able to start looking at that and you know accounting for temperature. Because most of the literature out, and correct me if you know something I don't, but it doesn't take account for temperature. Tammy, before you go, I'm just curious what numbers you're seeing. What what commonly do you see, and do they vary between your neonates and your adults? Um, so, you know, we published the, the number 340. We, I think, right now we're running higher hematocrits. Our hematocrits are basically 30. We are we are not quite as a high flow center, I think, as Jim has published, but we're a pretty high flow center. So we are close to range, but we, when we do get colder. And some of you know the ACP and some you know some of the more challenging cases we will dip, um, but that's where we want to be able to take into account temperature. Great. So for those of you that would like to track DO2 but don't have the fancy electronics, uh, the PEDS committee is putting together, and I think you might still be able to see it, but uh, even though it's not completely finished yet, but there is a, and this didn't come from them, but there there are uh, charts that you can get and just hang on your pump flow rate, crit, here's what your DO2 is um, uh, for your for the patient side, uh, BSA. So you don't have to have uh, all the fancy doodads to, to be able to kind of get an, a pretty good idea of where you're at um, with your DO2 if that's something that you want to look at. We, for a, a, within our practice performance metrics that we measure every case, one of the things that we've been looking at and tracking for a number of years is DO2. And for a long time, 270 was our cutoff because that was really the only published literature about it, even though most of our kids are, you know, peds. Well, we knew that, we didn't know, but we had an idea that it might be higher for some kid or for infants and neonates, but there was nothing published. And we really try to um, uh, base our practice on the evidence and not just guessing. So we figured, well, if we weren't lower than that, well, that would at least be okay. So we tracked that for a long time. And then now recently within the last few years, there's been a number of papers coming out that uh, indicate 300, 350 uh, for infants. Um, and so we've just recently adjusted it. So with our uh, adults, it's the 270, and then everybody else, it's 350 or better. We do run a 3.0 index on just about everybody um, with a Nader Crit of 25. That's our post dilutional calculation, is to go on bypass with a Crit of 25. Um, so we're usually making those, hitting those marks. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, I don't know how many people have seen it, but Donnie Lukoski and his team just published a paper just a few months ago. Yeah, that said that um, with a, a lot of statistical mumbo jumbo that I don't know anything about, uh, but basically said that we might have been looking at how the the uh, uh, the the way the statistics were done on the DO2 calculations from all the papers, and they may have been not so good. And so they did it a different way, and they came up with different numbers, which I think were lower. But at any rate, I won't, uh, I won't spoil any of those uh, uh, presentations that are coming up. But so another good reason, again, as I mentioned in my um, talk, to always be reevaluating what you think you know is true and take a look at it to make sure it's true. Yeah, great. Richard, do you have a question?
AKI. So, for example, when they've, where they've kept the DOT above 350, actually they've not seen a, in a, uh, a reduction in incidence of stage two and stage three could ego AKI. So given that we can't actually show any improvement, what value do you really put on DO2? And again, I'm playing devil's advocate because I'm not up there, I'm down here. Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I will say that, and I always say this, you know, if we rely too much or at all on any single variable, then we're not gonna be doing a very good job. So it's, it's one piece of the equation and it's in a popular one recently and so is studying of AKI and, you know, um, and, and so uh, uh, for, for good reason, there's a lot of, you know, hubbub around it, but um, we just recently, because we, like I said, we for years have been keeping above 270. And so we just recently uh, did a study, it was a retrospective analysis of, of all of our patients with by the minute DO2 um, to look at. And so we had 1600 patients or something like that in there over five or so years. Um, we haven't done anything with it because as we feared, we weren't really able to tease anything out because we kept everybody high. So we couldn't, nobody had low DO2s necessarily. So we couldn't really tell for sure that it was an advantage. Um, we saw some trends, but the confidence intervals were so wide, it was basically worthless. Uh, so it's a good question. and and. I like, like I said, that's all I can really do to answer it is to say we, there, there might be a valid question. Yeah, that's good and bad, right? Looks like you're doing something right, but then now we're, you know, we're not coming up with any, any new conclusions. I just think we're in the early phases of the literature. I think that there, you know, we have a long way to go. I think we've just scraped the surface. I think we are going to need to take into account kind of what you're saying, not just one value, like all of the values that Tristan presented you know, earlier today, and it just is one piece of the pie. But I think that we'll hopefully uh, the work that's being done and over the next, you know, five to 10, we'll, we'll get some more answers. To the question, what's the value of DO2I? I wasn't a rapid adopter. I didn't, I don't take every little piece of the literature and put it into the curriculum because maybe it's not going to be valuable in five years. So I really was slow to make it a hardcore part of the curriculum. Uh, and then Riley came along. God dang it. <laughs> so Riley was there. He said, we got to teach this. So we started teaching it. And uh, so I was forced into, I had to know the answer when the students were telling it to me and I had to believe in it. And, and I came to adopt that what I really liked about teaching students to do DO2I, whether or not the number, whatever the number is going to be with the latest paper, was that we had always had in the curriculum the idea, you got to look for bad venous drainage. We think from the review of the, of the students' case reports, you know, like 1,200 case reports a year from 18 students to 120 cases. Um, the number one problem with a cardiopulmonary bypass is bad venous drainage. So now I have an objective number to say that you can legitimately put your foot down. You must fix those cannulas because I'm below my minimum flow based on DO2. I doctor it's science, it's not me. So I like it for that. Follow up, Richard, or I can lob him another one. Okay, I just wanted to ask the audience if you have anything for this panel. You've got a lot of great minds on this. If there's something that you want to know about or think about, please come up and ask as well, or lob them something. Um, but my next one has to do with best practices. Our institution we have recently adopted changing personnel out because our practice necessitates it. I'm curious on how you get people to do similar best practices. <laughs> well, interestingly, and a couple of my colleagues are in the audience, they'll remember, we, we've been doing this for a really long time at CHOP, but we used to call it standardization. And not everybody stayed at CHOP because they didn't want to do it the same way everybody else was doing it. And we fought this for years. And now it's in fashion, and now we recognize, and that best practice sounds much better. Uh, but I think part of, part of it is, is for, for, for now for us at CHOP, a lot of it's literature-based, you know, we go to a lot of meetings, you know, we see what, what, what is it in the literature, what everyone else is doing. And then we have a lot of discussions and we get buy-in. And I don't make everyone do things the same way. We talk about it. We figure out what the best way is for pediatric patients at CHOP, you know, with our team. And, and you know, obviously, you know, based on what's out in the literature too. But that's kind of how we do it. 
What, what do you do when someone doesn't want to do the breast practice? That's for both of you. Uh, 40 lashes. <laughs> yeah. so, so I think that's a really good question because it, 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 not what you do if you don't, but the, the original question. Um, because so when I first started at Cincinnati Children's, there uh, was a, there was selectedness um, by surgeons, depending on the case. And I'm not necessarily the best perfusionist in that institution, but because I was the chief, they would say, oh, we're gonna do this really complex case, you should do it. Well, you know, for us, we have a, a very um, laid out call schedule and who does the cases and all that stuff. And if you have to do a case, or you get to do a case that wasn't in your rotation, then that, one, it, it messes with your uh, work-life integration. Two, it also makes other people feel like that they're not good enough. And so that shouldn't happen. Um, the good news, you know, for us is that we did a lot of that um, work around minimizing variation. People don't like standardization, so use semantics and change it around a little bit. We minimize the variation. And... Uh, which has led over the years of earning trust of the surgeons. Surgeons don't care <laughs> who's sitting behind the pump at all. And it can be me or it can be our newest team member. And even if it's our newest team member, they don't care because they got that backer there that might have been there for 10 years. So they have no problem at all because our outcomes are almost identical because we all, like Tammy's team does, we sit down and we discuss, we beat the horse to death, we bury it, we dig it back up, we beat on it a little bit more until we figure out what we think the best way is to do something based on the evidence, the institution, and our practice. And um, that's very well accepted um, by our surgeons and our anesthesia team. So we, we used to not trade out cases either, but one of the goals and one of the ways that we were able to get people that were a little bit um, resistant to standardization was to say, hey, we can add a little more predictability to your life because if you don't have to be here till eight o'clock at night pumping your case and you can hand it off at three o'clock because it doesn't matter who's pumping the case because we all pretty much do it the same way, then that's gonna be a big benefit. So that's one of the things that, that I think can help um, uh, when, when you go in to try and uh, minimize variation within your practice. Uh, we, uh, we will take and we can show um, within our department, uh, Sean Klingen does our quarterly practice performance metrics and each quarter we go over it and we look at funnel plots based on all of our um, uh, practices. And it, I don't know how many of you understand a funnel plot, but basically it means that we can look at it and we can tell and we can see if a perfusionist is performing statistically better or worse than the rest of the team and at goal for what we've set for those metrics. and. Uh, when a surgeon says, well, I want the best perfusionist, I can say, well, it doesn't matter because I can show you when we lay the, this all out that we all are performing pretty much the same. So it's good to have the data and it's good to have a long time to convince the surgeons. Yeah. I'd like to add to that that I think that this is also a safety issue because if you have a variation in your practice and you come in to take over somebody else's pump and they put clamps somewhere that you don't know or you don't see, that it eventually becomes a safety issue for your practice. Yeah. Yes. Now that I understand the question, I would add, we're trying to build perfusionist entry-level graduates that can comply with whatever your situation is. So how, how do we, what do we do? We give them defined parameters. There's a surgeon preference sheet and they're gonna follow those preference sheets. What do we do if they don't follow them? They lose points. Uh, in their in their assessment um, and they are being taught to uh, to follow whatever the parameter is so whatever the research of the day is they should be able to change it when you guys decide this is how we want it done at this hospital they shouldn't have a, a strong bias on what Bruce said do it that way in fact I said never say that never say Bruce said do it that way um, and we're trying to integrate into the simulation we have this, the essence pump and we have the spectrum pump. They, uh, the, the, the Viper system is coming. We've got the Califias. We are like one year away from being able to have them sitting down on their simulated cases, generating this data and analyzing this, just like you're doing. It, become, it will become a class project with regard to 
hey, how are you, how's your class or your group doing with regard to sticking in the parameters? And I hope that in the, in the future that uh, my assessment rubric, I won't grade blood pressure. We're gonna download your blood pressure and it'll, it'll be graded by area under the curve. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm glad we That's have great. your education perspective, Bruce. Um, we have about two or three minutes left and I would like to try to get to both of you. Let's go here first and then get to here. Oh, you're not gonna have enough time for my question, but I'll <laughs> ask it anyway. It's about HDR versus ACT. Um, what is your slope range that you use? Um, and our institution used to be 80 to 120 coming from the HDR. We've expanded, expanded that range down to 50 to 120. Um, Again, what's your range? Uh, how do you treat this if it's low? Um, and then what is your highest concentration that you would use um, within the HDR? The reason I ask this is um, ha half of our team are, are uh, against giving heparin when your ACT is 1,000. We keep giving more heparin and more heparin. We've given a lot more heparin in the last few years by expounding that slope. And then there's been rumblings within the team and other teams saying that, our, our neonates are bleeding because we're giving so much more heparin than we have in the past. So there's that can of worms for you. Yeah, I'm going to give this to Jim. We did trial the HMS, but we, our surgeons were averse to giving more heparin, and so we, we do not use it. So we, we, do, we use the HMS. We do use the HDR. Um, so that, there's a couple questions in there. So our range is the 70 to 120-ish. We will run, we get AT3s the day before uh, on our pre-ops. So we kind of have an idea where the kids are gonna be uh, along those lines. If we have a, a poor slope and a low AT3, we will still give some FFP rather than recombinant AT3. Um, I know there are some places, Vince Olshevi at Norton's, he puts AT3 in the pump prime um, and doses the patients with it. I, I think that's a great, a great idea. It's, it's a really expensive. Um, but that's really the only drawback to it necessarily. Um, so I will say though that sometimes when we get those really high numbers, six, eight, seven, one, eight, something silly like that, sometimes I'll just run another one. And sometimes I feel like it's a random number generator because it'll come back a couple of points less when you wouldn't expect that because you haven't done anything to change it. Um, so a lot of times we'll give, uh, to treat it, we'll give, we'll ask anesthesia to give uh, about, you know, 10 to 20 per kilo of FFP. We'll run another one. It usually reduces it uh, by a point or two, and then we'll go with that. And we will give heparin throughout the entire pump run, regardless of ACT, in order to keep our, our target concentration. Um, I don't have any proof of this, but I do believe that it, um, when, you know, if you run out of heparin, you, even though your ACT is a thousand, it's probably because you're cold and you're diluted and you still have some level of subclinical um, um, factor chew that goes on that you're not realizing. And then I think that contributes to postoperative bleeding. So I think having those higher levels of heparin on board that at normothermia indicate that you're not using all of that is helpful. We don't tend to have uh, real bleeding problems. At least we don't think we do, but maybe we do and it's just normal to us. Um, but that's your, that's, that's how we manage it. So then what is the highest level you would go to six, one or. So, you know, if you, if you buy into it in, in its entirety, then every patient's, you know, different of course, and which we all understand that. And if the, if that's what the patient needs and that's what the patient gets. Now, if they're extremely high like that, sometimes what we will do is, um, or if it's out of range, what we will do is we'll give a, 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 a normal, a quote unquote normal loading dose, our, our minimum is 300 uh, per kilo is what we get. So if we don't, so if we have a really high slope and it doesn't reach 300 per kilo, then we give at least 300 uh, per kilo of heparin. Um, we may give that or, or give a dose that we think is appropriate, which would just be a guess because the HDR didn't give us a, what, a very good number. Um, and I would say we would cut off at that upper sixes number, um, but then end up, um, running that first post heparin ACT, see what, our tar see what our concentration is and what the ACT is. And if the ACT is adequate, 
then we'll set that concentration that it came back as and just maintain that. Does that, does that make sense? What I'm, am I describing it to where you? Right, that's sort of a new set point. Yeah. We have a very similar practice at Stanford. Same FFP administration, we also monitor HDR and then we keep everything high as well. Very similar. And okay. I mentioned, sorry, sorry just on our kids less than eight kilos, we arbitrarily also give FFP in the prime and give the rest of the unit on bypass. So that helps a lot as well. Same for us. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Bob uh, from Sacramento. And uh, back to best practices, I worked for one surgeon in a little uh, rural program for 15 years. And basically, uh, he left it up to us as far as what we wanted to flow and whatnot. And I found High flow, high pressures are always helpful uh, for all things, for adults anyway, and the DO2 is what you're chasing anyway when you're trying to uh, run high pressures and high flows. On the other, uh, I, uh, a couple years ago, I, I moved and worked at uh, a big program in Sacramento, second biggest adult program with eight surgeons, uh, four rooms, and spectrum pumps. And there, I really learned that the best practice, uh, I found the surgeon that's absolutely right all the time is the one I'm sitting behind and to not figure out and discuss philosophy during the case, but to do it after. And uh, we're in, they were an N minus one program uh, just because it's so busy and they can't keep people coming. So you do everything, put them on ECMO while you're on bypass, get them out of the room. But yeah, so uh, best practices is to learn the surgeon and what it takes to, these, they're all racehorses there, their results are off the charts, three stars all the time, and uh, be able to support them so they can have a good day and then the other stuff discuss afterwards. That's great. Well, I want to thank our panelists. That was excellent. We could go, we have a list, by the way, we sat down and wrote a list and we got to three out of the 20. So I'm sure there's much more to say on this topic, but it's soiree time. Richard is going to wrap up.